Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am sorry to tell you that Michael had no access to internet today. So uh, sadly, I'm going to have to take over from him uh, for him and uh, try to lead the class as best as we can. I mean, we are a meditation group. Each one of us can lead this group. Uh, we're all perfectly capable of doing it. So um, let's set our intentions first, please. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings not be separated from the happiness that has never known suffering. May they rest in equanimity free from attachment, anger, and aversion. Uh, let's do the nine purification breaths. Uh, we will visualize our body as a as an empty container. We will visualize the three channels. The important thing is that we connect the right color channel to the, to the emotion, to the afflictive emotion that goes with it. So when we are breathing out anger, we will breathe it out through the white channel. We will release any rejective feeling, any feeling of hostility, any feeling of discomfort and, and anger and impatience. We will expel it through the white channel. Any feeling of attachment, desire, addiction, uh, you know, all these kinds of things that have to do with desire, we will expel it through the red channel. Through the blue channel, we will expel ignorance. We will expel dualism, feeling like we're separated from others. And uh, we will expel uh, the ignorance of uh, self-grasping. Um, so let's start, please. And on the last out breath of the central channel, we will merge consciousness with space, consciousness arriving to the very top of the central channel and merging with space. Please let's take this right into a 10 minute meditation session.
Thank you, everyone. So we're continuing to uh, cover from our book, the seventh, uh, the 37 Bodhisattva Practices by Ngul Chutog Mei Zongpo. Um, the next section uh, has, uh, is called Bringing Obstacles on the Path. So uh, I'd like to read some quotes and just to go over a little bit uh, of what we've discussed before. I would like to um, start with a quote by Dilgo Cancer in Poche. Um, from his book, The Heart of Compassion, where he discusses the 37 uh, Bodhisattva practices. Remember the emphasis is the 37 refers to the skillful means which we employ in our life and in our intention of, uh, you know, traversing the path from an ordinary being with afflicted emotions, negativities, and the delusional uh, belief in the self to the Bodhisattva who is an enlightened being uh, from whom compassion issues simply as a result of his wisdom mind. So uh, Dilgo Kienzer and Boshe writes, when you realize emptiness perfectly, no effort will be needed for unconditional compassion to manifest since compassion is the expression of emptiness. So it's very, very important for us to understand really how things arise, you know, the phenomenal world and what we call the self. Uh, the minute we don't understand how things arise, the nature of consciousness and appearance in their non-dual aspect, suffering begins. All appearances, events, and thoughts that make up our life can either be the cause of bondage and suffering or the causes of liberation and compassion, which is the natural outflow consequence of wisdom. So the more a mind progresses on the path and in its gradual stages toward a wisdom of understanding reality, the, you know, the uh, conduct of compassion will become spontaneous. We, we, don't, we will not have to think about being being kind and being compassionate. It'll be just the natural expression of our mind, of our state of consciousness. All suffering starts when we say and therefore experience, why is this happening to me with the emphasis on me? In this case, dualism, ignorance and self grasping has already occurred when we say, why is this happening to me? That is the basis of suffering. It's the genesis of everything that is difficult and what you know we consider you know suffering. And it is the perpetuation of the wheel of samsara, creating through our negative and delusional mind, through you know the delusion of dualism and through negative emotions, which are kind of the package together with that ignorant mind, samsara is generated, karma cause and effect occur. On the other hand, if we look at appearances, our experiences as they arise, and we can say that their inherent emptiness is my inherent emptiness. So I will not attach to them and I will not get crushed by them suffering an unbearable night, like suffering an unbearable nightmare in my sleep. Rather, I will say to myself, these arise to teach me and to propel my consciousness to the next level. They polish my inner diamond until the stains of dualism and self-grasping are removed completely. I will remember emptiness, impermanence, and non-duality, because remember, those three things are the very core of the Buddha, uh, of the Buddhist path. Without these three, we're doing something else. We're certainly not engaging in Buddhism. You know, Buddhism is not this kind of light meditation to calm our emotions and to feel good. Buddhism is really to dismantle the ignorance and with that extinguish the negative, the negative emotions that go together with it, with the afflictive mind. Uh, we will say to ourselves, you know, I will remember emptiness. Uh, you know, 
I will remember uh, that difficulties arise because of my afflictive emotions. They are the consequences of my action. But at the basis, they're emptiness, they're impermanent, they're temporary events, they will pass and they have no substance, they really don't. We have to watch our mind because it is our mind that is the life sum, that, that is our life and is the sum of all of our experiences. Therefore it is the mind, is that what we experience? Ignorance binds us and makes us suffer. Awareness liberates us on the path until the summit, enlightenment. If we approach, if our approach is through the gateway of understanding this, that without suffering, there's no path, suffering, karma, cause and result, is the way the universe balances the scale. If Right now I experience the suffer, suffering, which is a result of my previous wrongdoing, my previous action and of my ignorance, which catalyzes this because ignorance is the genesis of samsara, as I said before. Then if you have that understanding, if you're armed with that understanding, you will understand simultaneously too, that through suffering you're being purified and you're being illuminated and something is being balanced. And you, you say to yourself, I have the capacity to watch my karma unfold like a movie. I have the capacity to right the wrongs I've committed by my ignorance and self-grasping. And we will be okay through all this. We will survive. Another word, another way of understanding this, if we look at difficulties, all suffering becomes like the wood for the fire of wisdom, right? We use the suffering because we understand that the suffering is directly connected to our previous ignorant and afflicted actions. We use that for toward our enlightenment on the path. Uh, this is the whole, the next seven stanzas have to do with that. Uh, uh, bringing suffering on the path, you know, think of the suffering as the fuel for your journey as your state of consciousness evolves. This is how we keep our heart warm and our mind illuminated. But we have to have this awareness because without it, uh, nothing but perpetuation of samsara will occur. We cannot hope for any other results by simply being a nice guy we cannot stop the flow of samsara because in this world actions will be still very polluted we may think that we're doing a nice thing but very often you know it's subject just to kind of mundane rules it's not really coming from a place of wisdom and it's not coming from the place of skill you know buddhism requires absolute and total naked brutally you know brutal honesty and uh you know that's what we're trying to do that's what we're trying to burn as fuel. Uh, I wanted to mention to all of you too that the word Buddha, you know, we have to really think about what it means. So the word Buddha is used in several ways in our language. And we should examine them. One way we use the word Buddha is to refer to our historical teacher, Prince Siddhartha Gautama, uh, who was born two and a half thousand years ago in India and who in our historical era became enlightened. And after he had attained enlightenment, it wasn't immediate that he decided to give us the teaching, uh, you know, but he, out of his heart of compassion, the heart of enlightenment is a heart of compassion. He decided to give the teaching and he gave us the view, path, action and result of that process of awakening. He gave us the map to awakening. Uh, and this map, if we follow it, it becomes our own inner journey to Buddhahood. So that's one way we talk about Buddha. But the word Buddha means awakened. That's what, it's a bodhi mind. It's a mind, it's a state of consciousness that is awakened, that is no longer asleep, that is no longer pressed down by the negativity, self-grasping, and all that overlaid garbage 
which is, by the way, you know, uh, in Buddhism is referred to as contaminated consciousness. Uh, you know, that eight consciousnesses we've discussed in previous session. Um, so the word Buddha means awakened, and it pertains to the state of consciousness in its primordial condition, the preconceptual, pre-deluded consciousness. Buddha means anyone who is awakened. We too will be awakened. The question is, of course, when? How many lifetimes will we waste before we decide to step on the path to awakening? Uh, from the previous uh, stanzas in the 37 Bodhisattva practices, actually the very, very first stanza, we learned that only human beings have the right psychophysical vessel to awaken. We can sit in certain postures. We have the right kind of mind. We have the right kinds of uh, circumstances. And we have the circumstance of the teaching and the teachers in our life in this historical period where Dharma is available. So we are the only beings of the six realms of beings uh, that have the proper condition and means to, to be on the path to enlightenment. Our paths cannot do it, sadly. We can pray for them, you know, we can wish them all these things. We can send them light, but they cannot sit and practice with us. So, uh, you know, it is our fortune. It is what is called the leisures and fortunes of a human vessel, of a human body and mind complex that is the right boat, the right vessel toward awakening. All six realms beings, including your pets, have the same Buddha nature like us, but it will take time for them to be born in our form, to enter our realm at the time when the Buddha teaching is being given for them to be able to step on this path. And we all have this opportunity right now. So we have to think about that very, very carefully. We also have to think about how many lifetimes we've already been here and circled in samsara you know, without stepping on the path, but simply like burning through our afflictions and suffering from, you know, the morning of birth to the evening of death. And we've done it so many countless times. That's why, as I said the, on the last, during the last session, you know, when we say all my mother sentient beings pertains to the uh, quantity of time we have been around, we have repeated this cyclical process of samsara. Um, Buddhahood awakening this the you know the word Buddha uh, it is the seed of all sentient beings in all the six realms as I mentioned before it's the very ground of being a sentient being it's the ground of awareness. It's the ground of all things that we experience. It's what we refer to as the nature of mind. Without this nature, not even stupid or not even evil actions can transpire. That cognizant, luminous nature, the ground, is from which everything can possibly manifest. There is nothing without it, truly nothing. Uh, it is the source of all conscious experience. And when that ground fully matures, our awareness reaches its ultimate state. We ourselves become Buddhas. That's why we enter Buddha path. You know, that's why we take this teaching, this particular roadmap, because it is a roadmap to complete realization, to a state of consciousness of an awakened one. So once again, this word Buddha is used for any man or woman who has reached the state of full awareness, of full awakening, as we all will at some point. There are Buddhas right now in our world, right beside us. Some that we don't know. You know, our neighbors could be these Buddhas, Bodhisattvas. Our, you know, Family members could be fully awakened beings, but you know, uh, you need a certain level of awareness to be able to perceive that quality in others. You know, our state of awareness determines how much 
we can be cognizant of. You know, it's like a shutter. The smaller the mind, the smaller the picture. So there are many, many things in this universe that we don't get to see because our shutter is so closed. Our mind is so small. But rest assured, these Buddhas are right beside us, you know? Our teachers are these Buddhas. They are awakened. They are visible Buddhas. They're visible because they're only here to teach us, to give us the roadmap, to guide us toward our own enlightenment. And believe me, for Buddhists to deal with little beings like us is not the most fun thing. You know, it's like being with, you know, two-year-olds all day long, listening to all their complaints, their pretend theater of all this adulthood, you know, not easy. And all the selfish stuff, you know, that is always asked of our teachers not easy so you know this is the time that we understand what you know being fully compassionate and fully realized means that they bear this kind of uh patience toward us and spend their entire the entirety of their life dedicated to guiding us and praying for us and clearing our path of debris <laughs> so anyone's mind that has reached the bodhisattva level or buddha level they're pretty much the same as far as their mental state uh, whose view is unimpeded acts of pure compassion in this world is either a buddha or close to the state of awakening because it is even though they talk about buddhahood as something that happens uh, instantaneously in an instance there is a gradual process of removing the debris before the diamond can shine. You know, our ground has to be revealed for us to be able to experience it, even though it's always there. It lays dormant until the right conditions and circumstances awaken it and make it blossom. It's like a seed in, you know, that's placed in the winter ice ground. It will have to wait for the sun and for the rain and you know for the conditions of warmth and stuff like that uh, so i do personally feel that all the pain of samsara is a very condition to get us out of the sleep of ignorance uh, and ultimately i feel like suffering for me personally i feel like suffering is an inconceivable blessing when one has wisdom and skillful means, one can transform ordinary suffering, which is the essence of clinging to the self and dualism with its five poisons. Uh, you know, the five poisons are afflictive emotions, anger, jealousy, arrogance, ignorance. Uh, you know, these poisons manifest always in me and the other, we project the other. I hate him, that's anger. He, he has more than I do, that's jealousy. I'm better than him, that's arrogance. I want that which he has, and that's desire. So there's always this dualistic mind and then these negative emotions. Um, we can let go of all these poisons which keep us in samsara. We can take that very suffering because we suffer the poisonous emotions. We suffer, I hate him. We don't so much suffer him. We suffer the thing, the I hate and whatever it attaches itself to. We suffer the poisonous emotions. Remember, it's not the things that bind us. It's our clinging that binds us and hurts us. If we are armed with this knowledge, we can incinerate these negative emotions and uh, self-clinging on which it's based in the blaze of awareness. We don't need to get caught in that web. We don't need to get trapped. If we cannot yet do it in the moment when the poison arises in the concrete situation, we can do it later in the meditation session. And I assure you that as you train, in a difficult situation, your awareness will arise sooner and sooner, and eventually it will arise on the spot. There will, will be no one you hate, and there will be no enemies. When you desire someone's possessions, 
you will look at it as nothing but your own clinging mind. You will see it in, in, in light of your awareness. You'll illuminate it. And then you can laugh and consume this little flicker of ignorance. And you move, you know, without being bound by it. So you do these practices on the spot and you do them in meditation sessions. You, if you can't see that right on the spot when the negativity arises, at the end of the day, when you sit down and you examine everything you've done through the day, what you examine is you look at your positive and negative uh, arisings, what has happened, these occurrences. You purify them, you know? You confess, you purify them, and you vow that, you know, I will see this thing sooner. I will not be so possessed by it. And I assure you, you, you know, these emotions will become thinner and thinner and very, very thin. And you will have much more control of everything in your life. Buddhas are also called victorious, the victorious ones. Why? because they have converted these two things, ignorance and afflictive emotions, because they always go together, you know, uh, uh, holding to the self and afflictive emotions, one package. It's like the sun and warmth are one thing, right? So if you have ego clinging, negative emotions are like it's side effect, it's warmth. They're one and the same. It's a unity, you cannot separate them. They always go together. So as long as you have clinging to the self, you will have these negative emotions. Uh, ignorance and afflictions is what separates us from our own Buddhahood. And these two things are the perfect storm which generate every conceivable suffering we go through. The sufferings may seem different in their specific new wrapper, but the ultimate nature of each and every suffering are these two things. This is the basis of karma cause and effect that has been unleashed by these two causes forever. I mean, as long as we remember self-clinging, we remember like holding on to this ignorant thing of the self, there has always been these negative emotions. And uh, Dogokian Rinpoche says, as such a beautiful phrase I'd like to quote, he says, your real enemies, enemy, is your belief in the self. That idea of an enduring self has kept you wandering helplessly in the lower realms of samsara for countless past lifetimes. So we will, uh, let's read uh, from the Bodhisattva practices, number 11. Number 11 is the most crucial of all the stanzas in the 37 Bodhisattva practices. It kind of encapsulates the entire philosophy of Buddhism. All suffering without exception comes from wishing for one's own happiness. This is what I just referred to, self-clinging and the poisons, that the afflictive emotions that are one package with it. That's what it means, uh, wishing for one's own happiness. All suffering without exception comes from wishing for one's own happiness. This is like one sentence that describes it all, why we're in samsara, what separates us from the Buddhas, why are we like stuck here and not on the path? This is why, you know, because we desire our own happiness. The perfect Buddhas arise from the altruistic mind. Therefore, completely exchanging one's own happiness for the suffering of others is a bodhisattva's practice. And, uh, We've already done that practice uh, of exchanging our, ourselves, our own happiness for the suffering of others. We've done that, that is called Tonglen practice. This is when we inhale the negativity of others. We first of all, we visualize a crystal sphere in our heart that from which very strong luminosity uh, is, is beaming all the time. You know, we project this light throughout you know, and then when we inhale the suffering of others in the form of dark light, the minute it enters into, you know, it touches, it comes near the uh, crystal in our heart center, which exudes this powerful white light, it's disintegrated, it's diminished, and then we exhale again the white light and we send it to all others. This is a form of practice of exchanging self for others. We've already done it. We, we all already know it. And um, I'd like to read another 
a quote from Dilgo Kanser and Poche. And he says, if you allow the negative emotions to express themselves in the ordinary way, you cannot hope to progress on the path. If you do not skillfully deal with them, either by getting rid of them or pacifying them, they will lead to boundless suffering of the lower realms. Overcoming them will allow you to progress on the path to Buddhahood. So keeping in mind that the stoneland practice, the exchanging our happiness for the suffering of others is the most effective, skillful means that is at our disposal. You know, it could be a preliminary, uh, a middle level and the highest practice, and we can use it all the time. This is the paradigmatic practice for us going from our selfish, ignorant, you know, afflicted state to the state of Buddhahood. This practice is done you know, by all the great teachers, it's, it's, it really is kind of like the heart essence practice uh, of, of the Buddhist path. Um, then the next few stanzas, they all relate to the fact uh, that we've created negative karma and these difficulties that arise as a result of it now in this life, we have to deal with them, we have to face them. So stanza number 12, even if others influenced by great desire steal of, uh, all of one's wealth or have it stolen, dedicating to them one's body possessions and virtues accumulated in, in the three times is a bodhisattva's practice. Number 13, even if others try to cut off one's head when one is utterly blameless, taking upon oneself all their negative deeds by the power of compassion is the bodhisattva's practice. Number 14, even if someone broadcasts throughout the billion worlds all sorts of offensive remarks about one, speaking in terms of that person's qualities with a loving mind is a bodhisattva's practice. Number 15, even if in the midst of public gatherings someone exposes faults and speaks ill of one, humbly paying homage to and perceiving that person as a spiritual friend is the bodhisattva's practice. Number 16, even if someone for whom one has cared for as lovingly as one's own child regards one as an enemy to cherish that person as dearly as a mother does, an ailing child is the bodhisattva's practice. Number 17, even if influenced by pride, an equal or inferior person treats one with contempt, respectfully placing that person like a guru on the crown of one's head, is the bodhisattva's practice. So these are called, uh, from number 12 through number 17, they're called the post-meditative obstacles that we take on the path. Tonglen is considered a more formal uh, uh, practice of taking obstacles on the path, exchanging one's own happiness for the suffering of others. Uh, these from 12 to 17 stanzas have to do with particular situations in life where we use our wisdom about karma cause and effect. We use our wisdom about uh, emptiness, non-duality and impermanence to deal, overcome and use all these difficult uh, situations as wood for the fire uh, of our awareness. Uh, and I would just like to quote a few more small things from the book, Answer and Poche. And that really pertains to, uh, you know, why negative things happen to us if we do that question arises, if we still have that in our mind. It is important to remember that if you lose everything you possess, it can only be the karmic result of you of your having deprived others of their possessions in the past. There is therefore no reason to feel angry with anyone other than yourself. Another quote, whatever someone may, uh, whatever someone may be about to inflict on you, even beheading you or some other terrible suffering, it is important to remember that this is a result of your own past actions. You must have done the same to others in a previous life. Do not get angry. Let your enemy do whatever he wants to get satisfaction. Be full of compassion for him. 
uh, I know it's sometimes very, very difficult, you know, uh, to understand, you know, why difficulties arise in our life. But I assure you, you know, there are causes that are grounded directly in us. You know, we create our own life. I mean, things don't just happen haphazardly, accidentally. Even the word accidental is just, we should examine, you know, the ridiculousness of that. And Bill Bukhantar and Pache says, you know, which I would like to conclude today's session is, uh, it is indeed when difficult times and circumstances arise that the difference between genuine practice and its mere semblance is revealed. So it is, we can, you know, what he is also saying, in other words, that we can only really practice when difficulties arise, when there is no difficulties. You know, we are relaxing, we, we are enjoying our meditation, uh, you know, we have a semblance, you know, that we're practicing Dharma, we're on the path. But the truth of the matter is, all this gets tested, you know. You're only bringing the water to the fire when the fire is on. If there's no blazing house, like your negative emotions, you know, your afflictions don't arise. Uh, you're not extinguishing anything. You're not helping anyone. You're just pretending, uh, you know, you're helping putting out a fire. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's the circumstances of negativities and difficulties, the circumstance of suffering that truly tests and also gives us the platform, the stage for seeing our practice and exercising, you know, our skill. Uh, with that, we have a little bit more time. With that, I would like to do uh, Tonglen. And first, you know, the first breath, we will, uh, we will dedicate it to someone with whom we have a lot of difficulty. You know, if someone whom we can call an enemy or a very difficult person, we will breathe in their suffering and send them the white light. On the second... Uh, on the second uh, Tonglen uh, breath, we will do it, you know, for beings in the world who are hungry, suffering, homeless, and all that, uh, you know, whoever, whatever difficulties you can bring to your mind. And on the last Tonglen breath, inhale and exhale, we will make our intention very vast. We will send it to all beings. And by that, I don't mean only human beings. We will send it to all beings in this universe. Uh, so please, uh, let's do uh, five minutes of Tong Len to practice.
Thank you, everyone. And uh, just to reiterate a little bit, uh, Tonglen is a, it's giving and receiving meditation, exchanging one's own happiness for another's suffering. Uh, most effective practice anyone can really undertake. And it's a very simple technique. In our heart center, we visualize a brilliant sphere, brilliant exuding light everywhere in all the directions. Uh, we inhale dark light from difficult conflicting situations and people. And as the darkness enters into our heart, it is dissolved because the light in, in the sphere of our heart is very powerful and we exhale the white light back to them in the form of whatever they need. If they need food, we can visualize food coming to them. If they need home, we visualize them in a beautiful house. If they need family, we visualize them at a table with you know many friends and family loved. So uh, practice, thank you for everything. And uh, if we can please do the dedication. By this merit, may all beings attain the state of enlightenment and conquer the enemies of faults and delusions. May they be liberated from this ocean of samsara and its pounding waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. And Michael will join you next week. And uh, I wish everyone good practice and uh, happiness and happy holidays. Thank you.